Hello, welcome to the fourth annual Awake Together Sleep Summit at the uh, American Sleep Apnea Association. Today we have uh, Dr. Michael Grandner, and he is with the uh, University of Arizona College of Medicine. He's the director of sleep and health research program. He is the director of the Behavioral Sleep Medicine Clinic and an associate professor of psychiatry. We also have Mark Rue, who is an OSA patient who has experienced some um, issues with sleep apnea and insomnia. So I would just like to do a little housekeeping. Uh, if you have any um, questions, we will not be able to see them in the chat necessarily. So if you could put them uh, your questions in the Q&A. If you see that down in the bottom of your screen, it'll say Q&A. You can just type them in there. And uh, Justine is in the wings here and she will let us know when there's a question and uh, we'll take care of it then. So thank you for being here, uh, both of you. This is, this is uh, a very nice uh, topic because we have seen so much, uh, you know, complaining about insomnia lately. I, I just, and I know Dr. Grinder just had a paper uh, come out. So we have a lot to talk about. Mark, would you be able to uh, share your story now with us? I would be glad to. And, and, and thanks for having me, by the way. This is an honor. It really is. And if I can help just one person today, I'll feel like it's worth it. And I hope we can help a whole lot more people. Oh boy, my story, it's a long one. So to make a short story long, um, um, I um, went to give blood and uh, they said, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Rue, uh, we can't take your blood today because uh, you have too high blood pressure. I said, I've never had high blood pressure. This must be wrong. And they said, no, it's quite high. And I didn't even ask what it was. And I went home and uh, checked my blood pressure. It was quite high. And so um, I was, ironically, the next week scheduled for a, a, a yearly appointment with my uh, general practitioner, our family doctor, and uh, went in and described all the symptoms I was having. I was tired. I was kind of mad all the time. I was, you know, um, after I was diagnosed, in fact, my, my wife said, you know, I was in a doctor's office for my yearly physical and I was reading a poster about sleep apnea. This is after I was diagnosed. And she said, you had every one of the symptoms. So I'm like the, um, self-proclaimed sleep apnea poster child. Um, I've had uh, my, my family practitioner, uh, once he finally diagnosed me, and I won't get into all that, but I will say that because of sleep deprivation, um, I was a maniac, um, really a maniac. I, I don't know how my wife put up with me. In fact, um, what happened, it took them two and a half years to diagnose me. And uh, they thought I had a brain tumor. They thought I had this. They I had thought I had that. I had uh, MRIs. I had C scans. I had x rays. I had blood tests galore. And my doctor just couldn't figure out what was wrong. And uh, finally, I, one day I almost burnt the house down. And uh, my wife came home. Uh, to a stove full of fire extinguisher stuff. I mean, I was nuts. I was out of my mind. And uh, she called up the doctor and she said, I can't handle this anymore. I'm thinking about putting him in an adult daycare center. So in, from October of 2013 
till I'm sorry, April of 2013 until October of 15. That was when I was diagnosed finally. I was a madman, but I had sleep apnea so bad. My doctor said that I had a like a sleep deficit. You know, my my brain was fried. Uh, my brain hadn't gotten enough oxygen over the years. And he said, Mark, this hasn't been going, going on for months. This has been going on for years. So uh, let me look at my notes here. So in April 2013, I hit the wall. I was a zombie. Um, they ran every test known to mankind. Um, and I want to say here, too, that um, when you're crazy uh, like that, if you're like sleep deprived, um, you don't think you're crazy. I'm, let me speak for myself. I didn't think I was crazy. I thought the rest of the world had gone mad. I really did. And I kept telling my wife, there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with me. And uh, I'll never forget the, uh, the day she took me on the last visit. That was the visit where he said, you need to do a home sleep study. I was so weird and so bizarre. First of all, I told her I didn't want to go, uh, that I didn't want to see the doctor, that I didn't have sleep apnea. No, I didn't even know about sleep apnea yet. I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. Um, but um, I was a madman. And uh, I realized why they use sleep deprivation as torture. I really do. Um, I couldn't think straight. I was just a zombie. I was taking five or six naps. Naps doesn't mean I'm sleeping. It just means I was laying on the couch. Um, anyway, we found a good sleep doctor. And uh, he's, he was the best and still is the best in the land. And well, let me back up. Um, my family doctor, when he called after I had the home sleep study, he said, uh, Mark, I've been in this for 35 plus years and you are the worst case of sleep apnea I've ever seen. And I thought he was kidding. I said, ha ha ha, Dr. C, you're really funny. He said, no, Mark, I'm serious. Wow. So I had to swallow that jagged little pill. Finally, uh, we have a good friend who's a PA for a cardiologist, and she said that uh, she could recommend uh, the best sleep doctor in the land. I think I mentioned that, and we went to him. But 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 it took us, a, I think it was a month before we could see him because he's so good and he was so busy. So my experience there was after I'd been diagnosed, before I could see a sleep doctor, I found myself in the middle of the night. I'm not making this up. It scared me to death. <gasps> I'd wake myself up gagging and um, choking. And uh, then anxiety would set in. And uh, I think anxiety is the the foundation of uh, insomnia, at least from my experience. It's like, I go, man, that was weird. I need to go back to sleep. But if, wait, I was choking. If I go back to sleep, maybe I'll die. What's going on with that? I don't know. And it became this crazy little um, wheel in this endless thing that I was going through. And um, so I moved to the guest bedroom. Uh, because I didn't want to keep waking up my wife who was working. Um, after I was diagnosed with severe sleep apnea, I was put on uh, Social Security disability. It was that bad. And uh, my friends were coming up and saying, are you okay? Yeah. What's wrong? Well, we're working on it. And it was a very, very, very strange time. Um, it was a very strange trip. And uh, I came out of it. And uh, I'm glad to say that now I would say that um, I've gotten over it. And um, I, uh, had, in, in the process, had to rebuild my brain. I really did because I literally 
lost my mind. So I read a lot of stuff about neuroplasticity and how the brain is malleable. And I did a lot of research and did all the tricks and tips that I could think of and could get and everything. And uh, in my opinion, that, that saved me because I, I think if I wouldn't have done that, um, I would have continued downward. I mean, I really had to rebuild my brain. So, um, but as far as um, insomnia goes, um, there's a lot of tips and tricks that I learned. And uh, somewhere here, I have a list of uh, what you can do. Um, but maybe that should be left to Q&A or to Dr. Grandner or whoever. But what yeah, I think that's good. Did you, did you have any experience with uh, just being so afraid to go to sleep because you knew that you had to get up the next day and what I can't go to sleep because I might die is what you said. So what what did you know that feel like to you? Uh, did you just did you just think about it all night and then you were not getting the sleep and worrying about, oh, I have to go to work, I have to function. I know that happened to me when I was a sleep tech and I would say, you know, go to sleep, go to sleep. Well, I couldn't. I was too jazzed up. And I would start worrying, well, how am I going to go to work? You know, how am I going to go to work tonight? So, Dr. Grinder, what do you think about what Mark is telling us? Do you, do you find this very common? Yeah, I mean, sleep is, is something that touches so many different areas of function, whether it's physical health and mental health and and. Sleep apnea, but when people, even when they get it treated, but often when they don't get it treated, what happens is the sleep apnea sort of metastasizes and, and starts, in addition to being just sleep apnea, it then also turns into other sleep problems too, like insomnia. Um, and it starts affecting other systems as well. Um, fear of not being able to sleep um, is, is part of it. Also, people who are waking up during the night and then even, even having a respiratory event itself. So often when you have these respiratory events, you'll wake up and you're suddenly awake and you've got this shot of adrenaline. Now, and even if you're awake and your respiratory event is over, you can't go back to sleep because you just got shot with adrenaline. So now you're laying there. You don't even often know why you're even awake. And you're like, I'm awake suddenly. Did I just have a panic attack? because I feel like I just had a panic attack, but I don't feel like, oh, should I be panicking about? And so it triggers all this stuff, which is not sleep. And then, and then what happens is that happens often enough where it takes on a life of its own. Um, I wanna show one image here that tells a story because this tells, the image tells a story better than, than I could. Um, so this is, this is sort of how, how insomnia develops over time. Um, okay, let me, let me, I'll share my screen with this picture. Okay. Um, let's see here. Make this work. Okay. So let me, if I share. So here's an image that talks about the three key model of insomnia. And this is important because in, of what insomnia is. Um, and when you talk about chronic insomnia, there, there's like three ingredients. So you have, here's, this, here's the line. And when you cross the line, you have insomnia. And most people start out, so this is pre-insomnia, they start out somewhere under the line. People aren't like born with chronic insomnia usually. Most of the time, something happens that pushes you over the line. So the first of the three Ps are the predisposing factors. So these are, this is your background. This is your genetics. This is like how high strung of a person you are or, or all of these sorts of things. The things of how close to this line did you start out? And these don't really change much over time because you know they, they are just sort of who you are. But the second P is an important one. 
That's the precipitant. That's the thing that pushes you over the line. You didn't have it before, but once you can't sleep, you have it now. And it's pretty severe. So for a lot of people with sleep apnea, it's a combination of things. It's it's the, these fears and stresses. It could be the CPAP machine itself. It could be these awakenings. All these sorts of things cause you to lose sleep. Um, these aren't part of who you are. They're an external thing that happened that cause you to lose sleep. And then over time, the impacts of those could eventually reduce over time as you habituate. They may never go away. But by the time insomnia becomes chronic, they're not actually the drivers anymore. This is why insomnia takes on a life of its own. It's because of the third P, which are the perpetuating factors. These are the things that keep the insomnia going over time. Um, even if, you, like, so this is, a lot of sleep apnea patients have this, where, where they had, their body got used to waking up. And then even when they're on CPAP, they still wake up. They still have a hard time detaching. They still have all this, this baggage attached to sleep. Um, and then and then we can treat these perpetuating factors. But I wanted to show the picture because it's easier to show than to explain. But there are these ingredients. And, and I think people need to realize that, that insomnia itself um, is, could be sort of a spectrum where there's like what I call it is sort of insomnia with the lowercase i and insomnia with a capital I. Where insomnia with the lowercase i is sort of like you know, you have trouble sleeping every once in a while, and it might last a little bit, but eventually it sort of goes away on its own. Um, or it's sort of low grade, and it doesn't really interfere with your daytime functioning. But insomnia with the capital I, that would be like what technically we would call an insomnia disorder. This would be a diagnosable condition. It's the difference between sort of being bummed out and having clinical depression. There's, there's a difference. They're on the spectrum with each other. The problem is with insomnia, we keep confusing one for the other. We think that what insomnia disorder is really just kind of a, a minor insomnia symptom, and we try to fix it like one, and it doesn't work. So once you get an insomnia disorder, these perpetuating factors take over. And the, and the data on this has been pretty rich for the past couple of decades, that it's actually these perpetuating factors that keep it going. It's this learned response where the act of going to sleep and the act of going to bed and the act of waking up in the middle of the night itself triggers the insomnia because it's like the bed becomes the dentist chair where like you're in there and you have all this baggage attached to it and you're responding to events that, that may not even be happening anymore or that you should have been you, you could sometimes even habituate to but so it has this baggage and and a big problem out there is that people are treating this as if it's just a minor insomnia problem so they use stuff like sleep hygiene so they use all these sleep tips like Keep a regular schedule and and avoid light at night and and you know avoid caffeine afternoon and 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 you know don't drink too much water at night. I mean those are all good things. Like washing your hands is hygiene. Everyone should do that. They should do it all the time. It will prevent you from getting sick. It will prevent you from getting other people sick. But you can't wash your hands out of an ear infection. Um, you can't wash your hands out of the flu. Um, and because and, hygiene isn't medicine. So hygiene can prevent problems or deal with small problems, but once it's sort of its own thing and it's causing problems, hygiene is probably not gonna be enough. And, and so I see so many patients who get frustrated with this because when they Google, how do I sleep better? What do I do if I'm struggling to sleep? They get all these tips uh, and then they go to the doctor and they say, and they ask the doctor, well, how do I fall asleep faster? What do I do when I wake up during the night? They get the same tips. They get the same stuff. And it's usually, and, and sleep hygiene is so ineffective once you cross that line into like that insomnia disorder. We often use it as, as the um, placebo control in our clinical trials of insomnia treatments, because it seems like it's something that should help, but it's actually completely useless once you cross that line, because the problem now is that you've developed all this baggage and this arousal and all this stuff. Um, and avoiding it doesn't won't work anymore. It's already there. You can try not making it worse, but so then we need to treat that. So how do we treat it? So what a lot of people don't realize is that the, um, the, the number one recommended treatment for insomnia, even in patients who have sleep apnea, is not sleeping pills, um, which is important. 
because a lot of prescription sleeping pills make apnea worse. Um, and so people don't want to take them. Uh, but it turns out they're not actually even the recommended first line treatment for insomnia. If you go to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, or if you go to the American College of Physicians, or any organization that has any kind of guideline as to how to treat insomnia, they're not going to say medications first. They're going to say CBTI. Um, and so for people who don't know, CBTI stands for Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Insomnia. Um, it's a non-medication treatment. It's it sounds a lot like other cognitive behavior therapy for like depression or anxiety. Um, those are more sort of psychotherapy approaches. CBTI is kind of like psychotherapy, but it's actually a little more like physical therapy than psychotherapy. It's more, it's more behavioral than cognitive. And, it, and really, I mean, when you think about it, it's a training protocol. So what it is, is a set of techniques that teach your brain to sleep when it physically can, it just has all this stuff in the way and it gets rid of all this extra baggage. And so it's a set of techniques that, and that's why it works because it's sort of reprogramming your brain to sleep. Some of the stuff you can kind of do on your own. Um, like one thing in particular is, is trying to limit any non-sleep activities in bed so that you want the bed to be the place where you sleep. So it's like, if you sit down at the dinner table and eat dinner every day, just sitting down at the dinner table can start making you hungry because the place has the power to sort of put you in that zone. Or like if you go to the gym, even if you're tired and you're cranky and you're hungry, once you walk in the door, you can make it through your whole routine because it's the only thing you do there. The place has the ability to put you in that zone. You want the bed to do that for sleep. But instead, if you sit down at the dinner table and now, you know, if you're working from home, you're working at the dinner table. The dinner table is where you're watching TV from. And the dinner table is where you're where you're checking your emails from. And, and, and it dilutes the ability of that place to trigger that response, to even make you hungry, even if you weren't super hungry before, because it, it, it doesn't get you in that zone. Or if you go to the gym and that's also, you work there and you watch TV there and you hang out there and you eat lunch there, it loses its ability to put you in that zone. We want to capitalize on that um, for the bed. We want to make the bed that sleeping place. So you want bed equals sleep. We often can't control the sleep side of the equation, but we can control the bed. That's why people say things like, you know, don't spend time in bed if you're not asleep. So, if, or if it takes you more, if, if you wake up, if you have one of these awakenings during the night and you're not going to fall right back to sleep, don't set yourself up for failure. Don't struggle and fight it. Get up, do something else for a few minutes. If your body's not going to fall asleep anyway, it's like if you're sitting down to eat, and you're not hungry, staring at your food for an hour is not going to make you hungry. If anything, it's going to be unappetizing. And if it starts happening day after day after day, you're going to have, you're going to start hating dinner time. It's going to start becoming excruciating. So, so yeah, I mean, you want to, you want to do that. It's, it's, it's easier said than done. And that's what, I mean, that's what people like us, that's what therapists like us are for to help walk people through that process. There's other techniques too, for modifying people's schedules and compressing and, 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 and boosting sleep ability and all this stuff. But the point is, it doesn't take sleeping pills to fix insomnia, even with sleep apnea, and they overlap a lot. And the data show that the people who have sleep apnea and have insomnia with it tend not to do as well. They tend to have a harder time with their CPAP because they're laying in bed awake with the, with the mask on and it's more uncomfortable for them. Um, they tend to do worse overall because insomnia itself causes problems. So. Uh, it's important to get the insomnia treated. And, and if someone's just throwing medication at you first, say, um, have, have you heard about CBTI? And they'll say, I think I might've heard about it. And if, and if they don't know anything about it, you wanna go to, um, you wanna maybe find a way to get referred to someone who can do that and, and who, who specializes in it. So there's a couple of good websites out there, the society, there's no patient organization for insomnia, um, but there is, uh, like there is for the American Sleep Apnea Association, but there is uh, a Society of Behavioral Sleep Medicine. They have a directory of, of people uh, who do it. There's also a website called cbti.directory that also has a list of people who do it. Um, your doctor may just not even know who to refer to. So, so come in armed with that. Um, the other thing is, especially this is relevant to sleep apnea patients, that insomnia isn't just about inability to sleep at night. It's also about how it affects you during the day. 
Sleep apnea also affects you during the day. And so this, this idea of, of, of daytime consequences like sleepiness and fatigue are important. So um, uh, something that, that Teresa was talking about is, is I had, there was a graduate student uh, out in Hong Kong who did a sabbatical in our lab a few years ago, and she was presenting some of her data. And what she showed was in, in Hong Kong, she developed this culturally tailored mind-body intervention for insomnia and depression that were together because they often go together. For those who don't know, insomnia and depression are like this. Um, sleep apnea also is a depression risk factor. So like, this is why mental health is so important here. Um, so anyway, she did this intervention for insomnia and depression, and she found that the depression scores improved quite a bit. But the elements of the intervention that improved the depression scores were not the sleep. So the amount of that their depression scores got better didn't correlate with how much more they were sleeping or how better they were sleeping. But the intervention worked. And so I asked her, like, why? And she said, because the intervention focused mostly on the daytime issues that, you know, we tried to fix their sleep as much as they could, but we help people understand their daytime symptoms, cope with them, be less sleepy, be less fatigued, be more at peace with themselves, like on all this sort of stuff. And that worked. So when she came into the sabbatical in our lab, what we did is we looked at some existing data and we looked to see, you know, each element of depression, each symptom of depression, there were nine different items on this depression scale. We looked to see was insomnia associated with each one and it was, but then we looked to see on the insomnia questionnaire, there were three kinds of questions. One was the, I can't sleep sorts of questions. Uh, a couple of the questions were daytime questions uh, and they were, they were like, Sleep, my sleep problems interfere with my ability to function. It's noticeable to other people. Uh, and then there's the perception symptoms of I'm dissatisfied about my sleep. I'm worried about my sleep. That that may you may, you know, irrespective of whatever you're doing, this is this is the perception. And what we found was that the sleep items on the insomnia questionnaire generally were not the ones that were correlating with the depression outcomes and the depression symptoms. It was mostly the daytime and the perception symptoms. They correlated much better with the depression symptoms than the sleep ones did. And this, this, was a, this was a really hard study to get published because everyone's like, yeah, 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 we know sleep and depression are related. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, you're missing it. The point is, it's not a, only about getting them to sleep. It's about the daytime. And if you look at our treatments, our treatments for insomnia are all about sedating people and getting them to sleep. We don't deal with the daytime symptoms, and we should. If anything, they might be more important. And, and honestly, I mean, I'm talking to patients now. This is, this is my perception as a provider, is that patients come into my clinic, and I say, well, what brings you in? What are you dealing with? They're like, oh, I'm having trouble sleeping. And, and I think that's, that's why they think they're there. But then when I probe a little deeper, I say, but then why did you come in? Why now? And they said, well, it's because I'm, I'm tired during the day. I feel crappy during the day. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not able to perform. It's, all, it's the daytime symptoms. If I could wave a magic wand and not change how much you sleep, but change how you feel during the day and that you're not fatigued and you feel great, would you be here? They usually say no. Um, and, and I think it goes to show that like, the experience of the daytime is what's important. By the way, we followed this up with anxiety symptoms. In addition to depression symptoms, we showed the same pattern. That it's, it's a lot of times it's the daytime issues are what matter. And I think as a sleep field, we sort of miss that. We sort of forget about, we're so focused on fixing their sleep because that's what we see as the problem. If insomnia is can't sleep, uh, the solution is sleep. But maybe the solution is, is not just about that. It's about how people feel during the day. So, so yeah, I mean, what you're talking about is, is something I see just all the time. As a psychologist, as a behavioral sleep person, like I often deal with people who their sleep apnea is being treated by their sleep physician. But that's not the end of their sleep issues. And so often, like I'm helping people navigate, like working with their sleep apnea, navigate across different providers maybe get connected to a psychologist or a psychiatrist if they need that too. Um, and then deal with some of these behavioral sleep issues. Because a lot of people have these issues around this fear, fear of the bed. I mean, this is not unusual. I see it a lot, especially in sleep apnea patients who are afraid they're gonna die. 
Um, Cause that's what they're told. And well, if you, okay. It's like, all right, if you fall asleep, you might die. Now go to sleep. Like now relax. Right. Like good luck. You know, it doesn't like, I mean, it, it just seems so out of touch uh, to, 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 to say that to people. And, and I guess I just want to say that you're not alone in that. Our field hasn't quite embraced this as a core of what we do, um, mostly because, you know, we're very good at a few things. And so we, we sort of focus on the things we're good at. But I think this is, you know, again, I'm talking to patients. I don't have to tell you what you care about. But, but I keep trying to tell this to my peers that this is what patients care about. You know, they care about their experience. They care about how it's impacting their life. Um, and these things are intertwined with each other. Oh, and also sleepiness and fatigue are different things. Sleepiness is, as, as you probably know, sleepiness is your sleep drive is high. Your body wants sleep. Fatigue is different. Fatigue is this psychophysiological experience where you don't have what it takes to meet the demands you're facing. Sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's emotional, but it's really a mind-body experience is what fatigue is. It kind of is. Where sleepiness, you may or may not even feel fatigue if you're sleepy, but they sometimes go together. Sleepiness, the cure for sleepiness is to, is to, fill, the, is to fill the well of sleep and so it's no longer dry. That's, you know, to feed the sleepiness so it's not hungry. Um, that's the solution to sleepiness. But that's not the solution to fatigue. You know, fatigue, you can't, sometimes fatigue is caused by lack of sleep or lack of quality sleep if it's very interrupted because of breathing issues. But not always. Often I'll get patients come in and their sleep is a mess and they're really fatigued during the day. So we fix their sleep problem and their fatigue gets better but they're still fatigued during the day. So they say, what am I doing wrong? Uh, you know, I'm like, well, you're falling asleep in 10 minutes. You're sleeping through the night. You're sleeping seven to eight hours, but you're still fatigued. Why? Or, or, or maybe even also still sleepy. So, so here's, as a clinician, I, let me just tell you the thought process that goes in my head. The, my first question is, is there something under the hood that I'm not seeing that's causing sleep to be artificially shallow? So number one is undertreated or untreated sleep apnea. You guys know this already. Most of you guys are probably treated already. So, but you'd be surprised. A lot of people are not. Um, I get a lot of people in my clinic coming in for insomnia with nighttime awakening saying, oh yeah, I have mild sleep apnea. I got tested 10 years ago, showed up as mild. The doctor didn't do anything about it. said it was no big deal. Um, but I still have these awakenings. I'm like, eh, let's get that checked out again. Um, so, so there might be under, under treated sleep apnea. Number two on my list is chronic pain or any kind of autoimmune condition or any condition where the body can't just can't let go because it's dealing with it, it's someone's someone's poking it all night. Somebody is asking for attention. Something internally is asking for attention when you're trying to disengage. Often, like pain is sort of the most common one of those if it's not apt. But there could be all kinds of stuff. People have autoimmune issues. People have um, other illnesses. People have muscle cramps. People have all kinds of stuff. Or GERD is another common one where like your body is demanding this attention and you don't even know what it's, what, what's going on. All you know is you're having trouble falling asleep. Um, so there's all kinds of things where the body is demanding attention. So in that case, you know, let's try and figure out what that is and quiet it down if we can, um, or work around it if we can't. So that's the next thing. So then, okay, so maybe it's not that. If it's, if it's not that, the next thing I look at is, is there something environmental going on? Is it, do you, are you sleeping on an old mattress? Or maybe like the mattress is great in the first half of the night, but then you get hip pain in the middle of the night and it wakes you up because, because it's not supporting you right. Or maybe, you know, there's, you're on a busy street and you don't even know it, but there's cars waking you up at night. Or maybe you've got a snoring spouse next to you. I had this patient once had, you know, he was, he was one of these guys, like you, you, you guys may laugh. He's one of these patients who came in, uh, he was a Marine 
and said, I don't need to be here. I don't want to be here. The only reason I'm here is my wife says she's moving out if I don't come to see you. Um, but like, I'm fine. Yeah, he's fine with severe sleep apnea, we find out. And then you get him on the CPAP. And, and what's funny is, then well he and he's he did great actually he came in he told me like all oh, my friends have this too so i got i told them all to get tested and, and it's like a, you know there's this whole thing but then what happens is now now that he's sleeping through the night his wife's snoring is waking him up he's like i didn't even know she snored because i was so tired all the time but now she does and it's waking me up so but now she doesn't want to come in <laughs> So, so she's like, so I ended up writing her a note of like, hey, like, this is important. Um, so like, maybe you have your, maybe your spouse is, is, or maybe they're moving around, or maybe something, maybe there's something in the environment, or it's too hot, or it's too cold, or something, or you've got a cat that sits on your face in the middle of the night. Um, that happens more often than, than people realize as pets. And so is there something in the environment getting in the way? So if we deal with anything internal and we deal with everything external and there's still fatigue, being totally honest with you guys, my next, um, my next hypothesis is if we clear all that stuff out of the way is do we have an untreated depression? Because depression is another one of these things we don't like to talk about. It's way more common than people think. And it doesn't have to be severe for it to be meaningful to, to, to you to have, for you to have symptoms. Like, you don't have to, um, you don't have to have the flu to have a cold. Colds still suck. Like colds are still annoying. You still have symptoms. They're still, they still get in the way of your life, even though if it's not the flu. And there's a, there's a range. So you could have depression symptoms. So what people don't realize depression symptoms aren't just perception. They're not just, I'm, I'm unhappy with things. When you have depression, your brain even changes. Your ability to process things slows down. Sometimes you even show up as, with tests, you show up as like early onset dementia sometimes. When you don't have that at all. It's just your brain is, just, is, is, is having trouble putting forth effort. It has trouble sort of um, navigating things and balancing things. And that gets experienced as fatigue. So a lot of people who will show up with fatigue, they actually had depression, didn't even realize it because they've been carrying it around for so long. It's like, this is my life. But then what actually you treat the depression, the fatigue improves. So I, like again, a lot of doctors won't talk about this, especially sleep doctors who don't have training in some of this stuff. But as a psychologist, I'm just going to level with you. There's a lot of, un just like there's a lot of untreated sleep apnea in the world, there's a lot of untreated depression in the world. And people don't always experience it as like, as, as an extreme of I'm sad and blue all the time. Sometimes it's, a, I'm just tired all the time. I'm exhausted. I'm overwhelmed. That's actually sometimes how it manifests where it's actually, it wasn't, and it was interacting with the sleep or maybe it started with sleep but then infected the day. But now that takes on a life of its own too. So anyway, that's what goes through my head when a patient comes in with this, these daytime symptoms. I look at what's happening at night. Then I look at what's happening in the environment. Um, and then I think of like, maybe there's some un something untreated there from, from a mental health perspective. Anyway, that's my two cents on this stuff. Dr. Greenler, um, how does getting poor sleep, like not enough, uh, having sleep apnea, fragmented sleep, how does that affect the brain? Yeah, I mean, in lots of different ways. So um, the, there's a few, a few different ones to point out. One is our thinking ability deteriorates. Um, sometimes, even temporarily so, but it becomes so chronic, it seems like it's permanent. Um, and sometimes when you're not able to pay attention to things for years at a time, your memory gets worse just because you don't have anything to remember anymore because you haven't been able to pay attention to anything. So, but then it also, it impacts your memory directly as well. And things like, like thinking ability and decision-making ability and, and ability to process multiple things at once. Basically, like anything that you know, like for your brain to be like in shape and fit and, and um, able to process multiple things, 
when you're not sleeping well, that's one of the first things to go. You're, you're holding on. You're not doing it well. Um, and so I think a lot of people with these experiences will be like, oh, yeah, that was me. Um, you know, and, and that's one of the ways that lack of sleep impacts the brain. It's not just that you're, you're tired and having trouble maintaining consciousness, which itself should be alarming, but it's also at all different levels. You're not as able to focus. And when you're focusing, you're not as able to maintain that focus. And even when you're maintaining focus, you have a harder time remember, uh, encoding new memories and learning things. And even when you do learn things, you have a harder time consolidating those memories. And even when you do consolidate, you have a harder time recalling them. And even when you have, can recall them, you have a harder time manipulating them and integrating them with your behavior. So like at all these levels, just from a knowledge and memory perspective, but also on an emotional level, it's the same thing. Where show me someone with a short fuse, I'll show you someone who's not sleeping well. Um, almost all the time. I mean, I bet you could, um, I bet you could, you could think about all the times in your life when, when either you had a short fuse or you knew someone who was very short fuse, they probably weren't sleeping very well. Um, you have a hard time managing emotions. So you might have more swings. You might get overwhelmed more quickly. Um, which interacts with the thinking because then you have a hard time processing things, which makes it more overwhelming. Um, you tend to you tend to have more depression symptoms. Uh, you tend to worry about things more, especially if you're spending a lot of time awake in the middle of the night itself. The brain doesn't like to be awake in the middle of the night. When you're in the wake in the middle of the night, you don't think well. You, you blow things out of proportion. You're emotionally dysregulated. No one sits there and, and thinks in the middle of the night. And, and it's this very happy experience. They're usually freaking out about stuff or they're worrying about things or they're ruminating. So, so that tends to make things worse too. Just our ability to think in the middle of the night becomes problematic. So then there's also the brain health stuff where um, like the molecules that, that protect us or, or uh, against dementia risk and the ones that accumulate uh, as, as our dementia risk increases, they're sleep dependent as well. Our ability to clear waste from the brain, which also is neuroprotective, that's sleep dependent as well. So when we're not sleeping as well, um, our, our, our brain isn't able to take care of itself properly. Um, it's maintenance. You know, if you don't give it what it, what it needs to function properly, you're going to feel it. And I bet everyone on here who's listening, who's had periods of time where their sleep was just a mess, they were also emotionally kind of a mess too. And their thinking was off too even if they didn't notice it at the time, in hindsight, they're looking back and they're like, oh my gosh, like, what was I doing? Um, so yeah, the, the sleep in the brain, sleep isn't only for the brain, but it certainly does a lot for it. Sure does. Justine, do we have any questions? We just have a few. Uh, Nanik was talking about, um, you know, using their, CPAP machine, full face mask, and still, you know, waking up, feeling tired, not really seeing a difference yeah. with uh, CPAP treatment in regards to insomnia and, and kind of leading into what you were saying, Dr. Grander, with the daytime, I don't feel any difference during the day. And it could yeah. be other things like you were saying. Well, so two, thi two things I want to say about that. First of all, I should give you a good definition of what insomnia is. Um, so insomnia, technically speaking, means you have difficulty initiating or maintaining sleep, where either it takes you a while to fall asleep, or you're awake during the night and can't sleep, where you're trying to sleep and are unable to. It's the difficulty getting to sleep wherever in the night it is, beginning, middle, or end. Um, and this is causing daytime problems, and it happens more than three nights a week. So like, if it takes you a while to fall asleep, and it's a, it's a in an appropriate opportunity. So like, if you're trying to go to sleep at four in the afternoon and it's taking you a long time to fall asleep, that's not insomnia, that's a circadian rhythm issue. Um, if you're going to bed and someone's banging pots and pans in the background and you can't sleep, that's not insomnia, that's an environmental issue. But if you're going to sleep and you're putting a CPAP mask on and you're having a hard time disengaging physically and mentally from this sensation and stuff and it keeps you up, that's insomnia. Um, 
waking up feeling unrefreshed, getting not enough sleep is not insomnia. That's insufficient sleep, totally different. A lot of people with insomnia also get insufficient sleep, but that's actually a totally other dimension. Um, so a lot of people with insomnia get six, seven, eight hours and still they have insomnia. Insomnia, it has nothing to do with how much sleep you get. It's about the struggle where you're trying to sleep and can't, but often they go together. Um, so that's something people confuse often. And also insomnia, so waking up, not feeling refreshed, it alone isn't tied to insomnia, often goes with it, but dissatisfaction alone isn't insomnia either. And, and I'm not saying anyone's saying that. I'm just saying that oftentimes people get these things confused, even uh, clinicians, especially like primary care people and people who don't have, who aren't used to living in the world of sleep and insomnia and parsing these things out, um, often combine them. So anyway, first of all, with insomnia, that's what it is versus insomnia versus insufficient sleep versus non-restorative sleep as, as separate constructs. Um, the other thing that she was talking about was um, that a lot of people with sleep apnea get it treated and they still feel crappy during the day. And, and I think, Justine, you were right, where it's like, well, here's my thought process is what's going on. But I should point out that that's not unusual. Uh, a lot of sleep apnea patients um, ha use a CPAP, their AHI goes way down, but yet they don't feel better. It's a mystery as to why. And I'm not saying it facetiously, it kind of is a mystery, because it seems to be that you can still treat, for a lot of these people, you can fix all of these other issues, but they still don't feel better during the day. Um, so there's a controversy in the field about this. Maybe the AHI in those patients isn't, wasn't the right indicator of their disease burden. Of whatever the process was, maybe there was something other than AHI that was happening to them. So by fixing the AHI, maybe we didn't actually fix whatever the problem was. Maybe it didn't capture totally what the problem was. So then what is it? Who knows? The field is, is wrestling with this right now. Because the, the people who do this research, they know something like, what, a third of sleep apnea patients say they don't feel a lot better to using CPAP. Does it mean they should stop? Does it mean it's not helping them? Probably not. It probably doesn't mean that it's not helping. But what does it mean? And so I think you're right. I'm just empathizing with your situation that like, yeah, you're totally right. And, and, any, and any doctor who tells you you should be feeling fine because your AHI is way down. Roll your eyes at them because they don't know what they're talking about. Yes, they should if you assume that these respiratory events were the cause, were the, were, the, were, the, were the only cause of all everything you're experiencing. But maybe they're not. Maybe they were the initial cause. Maybe there are changes in the brain that happen that are more long-term. Maybe it creates a new problem that requires a new treatment. We just haven't discovered yet. I don't know. I don't think the field knows yet, but don't let anyone tell you you're wrong for, have, for feeling that way because you're not alone. It, this, is, this, is a, this is a deficiency of the field. This is a problem we haven't solved yet, but it's a legit problem. I'd like to uh, have a comment from Susan. She had great success with cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, she went, and so some people are asking, how can they find a clinician in their area that either focuses on specifically the CBTI, the cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, or just, I guess, you know, in general, if they're having some other issues, how can they find someone? So, so the first place I would look, and I'm going to put these in the chat so you can distribute them. First one is behavioralsleep.org. This is the Society of Behavioral Sleep Medicine. It's the professional organization for people like me who do behavioral sleep medicine, um, who treat people with CBTI and, and other stuff too. Um, they, have a, they have a provider directory for patients. Be like, hey, looking for somebody? Um, here's one of them. Another one uh, is uh, cbti.org directory. I put that one in the chat too. That's actually the address, uh, the web address, cbti.directory. This one's managed by Michael Perlis at Penn. Um, he's trained more people in CBTI than probably anybody ever. And so he maintains a directory of not just everyone who's gone to all of his trainings, but he reaches out to, to everybody to try and try and get an active directory of, of everyone who's doing this. Um, another place, if, if you have trouble finding uh, someone in one of those places. First of all, you've got my contact information. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to help any ASAA person or patient 
say, hey, I live in Iowa, in Iowa City. Can you find, could, do, is there anyone who lives near me? I looked in the directories. I can't find anybody. Then what I do is I look in the, send me an email. Like I'm a human being. I can receive an email um, from, I, as long as I'm not getting like a million of these things a day, I don't get that many. So it's fine. Um, uh, I, I would look and see if, see if there's someone I know, or I can, I can go on the listserv. This happens all the time. We have a listserv of, of, of us clinicians where we keep in contact with each other. And every once in a while, I'll be like, hey, I've got a patient who's moving to Billings, Montana. Do it, does anyone know what someone, is anyone on this list, someone I could refer to? Do you know someone who I could refer to? And someone respond, hey, this person lives there. You should send them to, you know, I can, we can help. There's, the community is not that big, to be honest. We're talking, uh, you know, 10 years ago, it was dozens of providers. Now it's hundreds, still not thousands. So, so um, there's not a lot. Then the other thing I would say is the ASMs, um, directory of sleep centers, they won't find behavioral sleep people. However, um, most sleep centers will know of who in town is doing this. Um, most ASM accredited sleep centers will know somebody in town who they, because they usually have someone they refer to. Not always, but it's increasing. Uh, but a lot of times that's also uh, a, a something. Primary care people often don't know. We're working on it as a field. We're trying to reach out to them a little more because they're really the front lines. Um, but most sleep medicine physicians at least know somebody. Can you talk a little bit about, you touched on it earlier. Alice was asking about, you know, pain and sleep, fibromyalgia and sleep. Yeah. And you talked about, you know, that being another uh, issue uh, uh, interfering with quality sleep. Yeah, so um, the bad news is that that pain is a common disruptor of sleep, and um, and it can disrupt your sleep whether you're even noticing the pain or not, uh, where it can make your sleep more fragmented. Especially cases someone like fibromyalgia, where like they it's inescapable. That's the bad news. The good news is there's actually a whole literature on CBTI and fibromyalgia patients and chronic pain patients showing that not only does it improve their insomnia, it could also improve some of the pain outcomes because now you're sleeping a little bit better. Because what a lot of chronic pain patients don't even realize is the degree to which, um, the degree to which the pain issue is interfering with sleep is usually overestimated because it was interfering a lot, but then actually the human body habituates over time where people sleep with pain all the time. Um, it's just, they, it can make it harder to get to sleep, but people can still sleep with pain. It might not be as restful, but they can still sleep. Um, actually, it's that, it's not the pain, it's the suffering that seems to be contributing more to the sleep issues. Um, the pain itself is the physical sensation. The suffering is the anxiety and the fear and the baggage and the anticipation and the what if and all this stuff and that's where, and that's where the non-pharmacologic treatments can help because I may or may not be able to eliminate the pain. I mean, any fibromyalgia patient will tell you they've tried everything to eliminate the pain. Maybe eliminating the pain isn't the workable goal. The good news is you don't have to eliminate the pain to eliminate a lot of the suffering that that, that is separate from the pain. That's the baggage that goes along with it. And so, yeah. I, I, I deal with lots of patients that have pain issues on top of sleep and they come in feeling very hopeless. Um, and then I get to, I get to make them happy because then they're like, then, then, you know, a bunch of weeks later, they're like, Oh my gosh, I should have done this 10 years ago. I, I didn't even think this was possible. And I'm like, yeah, I would have told you it was possible. Like there's, there's actually a lot of room for improvement. People just get used to it. Yeah, Alice also said, you know, is there a way, you know, dealing with 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 pain and sleep apnea and uh, I guess some heart conditions, yeah. um, you know, is it just part of the program where you have to have four or five different doctors or is there a way to consolidate? <laughs> yeah, you know, like, so so the, the, the only recommendation I have with that is if you could, if, if you have insomnia issues on top of that, see a psychologist for the behavioral sleep medicine stuff because so I'm, this this is me talking to a bunch of patients the way i bill is different than the way physicians bill physicians bill by procedure so the healthcare industry the healthcare system 
tries to squeeze as many visits out of physicians as possible and nurses because they bill by procedure. Psychologists, we're so low on the billing totem pole, we don't have procedures. We bill by time. We have time-based billing. So, uh, so like, and the lowest increment is like 30 minutes. So you get 30 minutes minimum with a psychologist. So like, yes, we'll spend, we can spend 20 minutes dealing with the, the insomnia stuff. And then we can spend a few minutes like coordinating care. I'm often the one who's trying to bring together the neurologist and the sleep medicine provider and sometimes cardiology and whatever, because none of those providers have time to actually sit with the patient and like hear about all this stuff. And, and here we're like, well, they said this, and then they said this, and, and I'm not prescribing nothing because I'm a psychologist, but I get to be like, look, we all got to get on the same page treatment wise here, um, or I actually have the few minutes to actually do that. So sort of a, a, more of an insider tip of the, the psychologist has the time for this where the other providers don't get paid for it. I, I, I get the 30 minute slot. So, or 60 minutes if, if people have, have insurance that pays for it. So I get all kinds of time with people that they don't have with other providers. So I'll have the time to help disentangle some of these things. And I'll send an email, and that's the thing, as a provider, I'll back channel. I can send it within the uh, health record, if it's within the banner system, I can send them a, a message, an encrypted message, or I can just send an email, especially once we have a, a release, say, hey, I'm working with your patient. Let, let's get on, a, let's all get on a call together. And then we get to do that. That's great. We, we'll just take a couple more questions. We had a, sure. a question uh, from, from someone in the audience about uh, they're working with a psychiatrist uh, diagnosed with ADHD, mm -hmm. uh, a binge eating disorder. And please help me with the, um, I'm going to say this next, a diagnosis wrong, dysythmia. Di, di, dysthymia. Yes, there you go. Thank or you. Or dysthymia. So or dysthymia. Dysthymia. dysthymia yeah. So, sorry, I couldn't hear it. So, like the dyspnea is the is the breathing thing, and the dysthymia is a mood thing. So, dysthymia okay. as a mood thing is is basically it's sort of like low grade depression. Sort okay. Of. And could it's, those be related to his sleep apnea? Those those yeah. conditions that he's facing and working on with his psychiatrist. Yeah. Um, it, it, in a couple of ways. First of all, dysthymia is is can be brought on by. I mean. Any, anyone with sleep apnea will tell you that when sleep apnea, you know, sleep apnea can impact mood, um, even if it's not a full major depressive disorder. ADHD does too. Um, a lot of people don't realize ADHD isn't just like hyperactive kids. ADHD impacts a lot of relationships with the world. And then on top of it, how do you treat ADHD? With stimulants. So um, a lot of people with ADHD have really bad sleep, not only because the ADHD itself, impacts how the brain's functioning and, and makes it hard to wind down and all these things detach. But the medications themselves are stimulants. So because of this, uh, we have this issue where, where I got a lot of ADHD patients with insomnia and then when they have sleep apnea too, they're sitting there awake in bed and then they're, or they forget to put their, because the other thing with ADHD is there's a lot of forgetting, I forgot. Like where, so like they forget to put their mask on or they had their mask on, but they forgot to take it off or whatever. Um, and then you have to worry about what time they're taking their stimulant medications because you don't want to take it too late. Because like you have, even sometimes people take it in the afternoon and it sort of interferes with their sleep at night. So, and a lot of times the psychiatrist isn't thinking about that. The psychiatrist is thinking about what's the, what's the dosage of the medication? How long is it in your system for you to function? And if you get a solid four or five hours on the medication, just don't take it too late. Well then, so people are taking it at six, seven o'clock thinking they're going to bed at midnight but they still can't sleep. I mean, where I've got patients like, look, you can't take it afternoon. So your morning is gonna be productive, but you're gonna to have to deal with the afternoon or, or you're not gonna be sleeping. Um, so you need to time these things. So a lot of times psychiatrists isn't thinking about that element of it, but I see it all the time. Is yeah. that true with antidepressants too? That might help Alan here in the, um, in the chat. Yeah, and antidepressants. So there's a lot of antidepressants. Some of them, uh, some of them can be stimulating. Um, especially the ones that impact dopamine and norepinephrine, like, like the Wellbutrin and, and Effexors and stuff. Um, some of them could be more sedating. Like the, some of them, like the Packers tend to be a little more sedating. Some of them are variable. 
where some, some, for some people, the same drug could be activating or sedating because serotonin plays such a strong role in sleep-wake regulation, you know, may, and, and it, 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 it plays a role in sleep and it plays a role in wake. So for some people, it, the, the drugs that they're taking impact the wake system more than the sleep system, for example. So, but the way the antidepressants are working, you might want you might want to time when you take it. So for the ones that are more sedating, take them more in the evening. And if it's more activating, even if your doctor ask your doctor, is like, is it okay if I take this in the morning instead of in the afternoon? Like, especially or get something that's extended release, so you can only take it once in the morning, for example. So yeah, a lot of antidepressants. The other thing that antidepressants do, um, and I don't know that there's a lot of data on this in terms of sleep apnea, but most antidepressants dramatically suppress REM sleep. Um, and a lot of people don't talk about it, it can cut your REM sleep in half or more by take, just by taking an antidepressant. Now with sleep apnea, a lot of times REM sleep is where you have worse respiratory episodes. So um, suppressing REM sleep may be a good thing, but what it may be doing is by doing that, it might increase things like REM pressure. And there might be other things that it's doing to your sleep that might be interacting I don't think people have really explored this much. I don't know that there's like studies on this. All I know is there's data on, on REM, dis REM disruptions in apnea. Antidepressants cause REM disruptions as well. Maybe there's an overlap. Um, but yeah, so a lot of times antidepressants can, can futz with sleep and you might need to mess around with figuring out what time to take it. Well, I'm afraid that we have run out of time. We... Uh... We just appreciate you so much coming on and and talking about this. We have a lot of questions uh, from people all the time. Um, I'm glad you guys are talking about this too. I mean, for a long time, sleep apnea was was sleep apnea discussions were all about airway mechanics, and and I think the fact that talking about the patient experience and how it's tied to the, these other issues and the real life experiences people have. I mean, it just makes me so happy as a, as a researcher as an, and as a clinician that this is part of the conversation because this is, this is what we need. Well, one thing I, I would like to add is there's a lot of people out there probably that have sleep apnea. They don't know it. They and they're no walking idea. around and they're being half effective or a third effective as they could be. I used to be one of those persons. I got I got down to the point where I wasn't effective at all. I was yeah. a zombie, and uh, I was a madman. And I can't believe my wife is still with me. I mean, she's <laughs> a lady in the world. But you know, um, another thing is, you know, lately I guess uh, I won't get into it much. But since Robin Williams died, there's I. This is a very good thing that came out of that. That seemed like the time where we all started talking about mental health. And it was okay yeah. to talk about mental health. Yeah. And that's what I want to say, because as a former crazy person, I uh, <laughs> thought the world was crazy. Um, it, it had everything to do with my sleep deprivation, everything. Yeah. And once I got on the CPAP, by the way, now I'm on a BiPAP, which is serving me even better. By the way, I'm on 17 on the pressure, so and that's where it seems to be working. I also sleep nine and a half hours a, a night minimum. Um, sleep is directly related to mental health and physical health as well. Of course, yeah. it's you know, mind, body, spirit, and all that. But um, yeah, if you even think you have sleep apnea, or if you even know somebody who you think might have sleep apnea, you've talked to him about it. You know? It doesn't hurt to get tested. There's no needles. There's yeah. no blood. Like yeah. it's. Yeah, it's a drag to have all those wires connected to you. But uh, <laughs> hey, you know, a couple of nights doing that and then you know if you have it or not. I have a friend who's a doctor and uh, his wife asked him what he wanted. No, I'm sorry. He asked his wife what she wanted for her birthday. And she said, I want you to go get tested for sleep apnea. <laughs> and he goes, what else? <laughs> oh, I want. And he did. <laughs> and sure enough, they slapped a CPAP on him, and he was a whole lot less grumpy. And probably saved their marriage. I have another under us, like a generation ago, I mean, it's really been the last generation that talking about mental health was okay. Like, yeah. it's like with mental health, people are like, well, if my arm's not broken, I'm, I don't need to go to the doctor. 
like I guess men are like this in general. Yeah. But um, but that's not the like you can go to the doctor for other stuff too. Like you don't have to wait till your arm is falling off before you before you actually get help for it. Like you can go to the doctor with 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 a with a ear infection. You're allowed, and they'll write you a prescription for an antibiotic, and it'll make your life way better. Like you or you could suffer, but you don't have to. And I think, and I'm just really glad that we're getting to the point where it's like, this is just another aspect of health. It's an aspect of brain health. This is normal. We all have brains. Brains are complicated, human brains as more so. And this is just part of the human experience. Pretending it doesn't exist isn't helping. Exactly. And, and ignore the stigma. I mean, let's right. just get yes, please. That, you know, please. And, and let's get real. Thank you both so much for, uh, helping us get this message out. I'm going to share my screen so that we can uh, Okay, sorry. Oh my goodness. I they don't they shouldn't put me with buttons. <laughs> 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 My eyes aren't what they used to be in these little bitty icons. We really wanted to uh, take the time to thank our supporters uh, who provide a, for this summit, uh, provided an unrestricted educational grant for today's summit and for other programs and materials. Thank you all and have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.